Hey there. Hi there, and hi everyone. This is the Digital Marketing Europe Conference, and we're on the Tools and Channel Tracks. My name is Sahar, and we have with us Dan Benun from the AdSpace Agency. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. And uh, we're going to be talking about the fascinating world of e-commerce, right? I mean, 20% of retail purchases are expected to take place online by the end of this year, so I hear. Uh, it's a $6.3 trillion market. Um, you're going to be sharing some of uh, the tips and tricks for success with us today. Is that right? Definitely. Yeah. This is a market I've been involved in for the past decade. It's a fast moving market. There's a lot of opportunity and potential and happy to share more about it. Awesome. We're really excited to have you and to hear all about it now. Um, just a reminder for everyone who's tuning in that Packet and Manning are giving away free ebooks for the most engaged uh, folks on the session. So please ask us your questions in the Q&A panel, uh, rate the session, leave us comments so that we can hear from you. Um, and hear how you are doing. We'll address all the questions at the end of uh, Dan's session. So without further ado, Dan, I'll uh, pass it over to you. Awesome, thank you. So um, let me make sure we have our presentation up. Excellent, so today we're gonna be talking about the five pillars of e-commerce. This is a framework that we've developed in-house at AdSpace Agency to help e-commerce brands uh, understand what they need to do to scale. So it's a, a framework that we've developed and it's very effective at breaking down the elements of what every successful e-commerce brand needs to do and showing anyone who's interested in launching and growing their own e-commerce brand how to take these steps and implement these best practices. So let's begin. <clears throat> As I mentioned, the five pillars of e-commerce is a simple and effective framework to help any e-commerce brand scale. At AdSpace, which is the agency that I founded, uh, we've used this framework on over 100 client projects. We've worked with companies all the way from pre-revenue startups that are just launching, uh, all the way to brands with over 200 million in annual revenue, so mature, successful e-commerce brands that are some of the best in the business. No matter the stage, uh, we found that this framework provides the foundation needed to understand the levers of growth and then to drive growth, revenue, and marketing efficiency. So first off, a little bit of introduction on me. My name is Dan. I'm the founder and CEO of AdSpace. AdSpace is a D2C ad agency that works with some of the fastest growing brands in the business. A little background on me. I founded and sold an agency and an e-commerce brand previously to starting ad space. So I've been in the digital marketing space for over a decade now. I've worked with clients like Whole30, Ruggable, Koala, Daily Stoic, Ana Luisa, Rip Van, Marcus Limonis, Black Coffee, and dozens and dozens of others. Um, I've been featured on CNBC, Washington Post, and Forbes. I've helped generate over $500 million in revenue for our clients at the agency. Excuse me. And in 2023, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm helping to launch Growify, a new omni-channel advertising analytics platform that um, we'll talk a little bit more about later in this presentation. So let's, get, let's dive right in and let's get started. What are the five pillars of e-commerce? So the five pillars of e-commerce, we divide them up into five distinct sections. Once again, these are the five things that any brand needs to focus on in order to scale their e-commerce uh, brand. Number one is product market fit. So essentially product market fit is how well does your product fit a target market. Number two is site experience. So let's say now you have a great product, you've established product market fit. The next thing you need to do is establish a site experience that operates as an engine of conversion. So site experience is really uh, judged on its ability to drive high conversion rate. Once we have those two elements in place, we need channels of acquisition. Channels of acquisition can be anything from Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, all the way to word of mouth referral, TV, radio, newspaper. Uh, and you know, there's literally thousands and thousands of different acquisition channels, but I've listed some of the most popular ones. And what we really need to understand in acquisition is which acquisition channels are the most important for each brand. Every brand has different acquisition channels and it's extraordinarily important 
to understand which acquisition channels uh, are the best levers of growth for your specific brand. Once we've established those three, we move into life cycle. So once we've acquired customers, we now need to grow and increase the lifetime value of those customers. So when we're talking about life cycle, we're referring to how we are building the lifetime value of a newly acquired customer. So they don't just purchase from us once, they purchase from us dozens of times, hopefully hundreds of times, building up their total lifetime value over the course of engaging with our brand. A great example of lifetime value is Coca-Cola or McDonald's. I think anyone who's had a Coca-Cola or eaten at McDonald's understands very quickly, very clearly that they haven't done it once. They haven't had one Coca-Cola in their life or eaten at McDonald's once. Typically people go there multiple times a year, sometimes even you know consume multiple times a month, either of those products. And so both of those products, although very inexpensive, have a very high lifetime value. Finally, once we have product market fit, site experience, acquisition, and life cycle, the final element that any brand needs to be successful is reporting and analytics. So how are we keeping track of all of these four other metrics? Well, without reporting and analytics in place, we can't monitor those KPIs. We can't understand what's happening. And so that's extraordinarily important as well. All right, so diving in, we're now gonna go through each one of the five pillars and kind of take a deep dive through those uh, um, deeper details into each pillar uh, with the goal of better understanding how we can leverage this information to drive success and scale with our own brand. So number one, product market fit. Does your product fit in a, in a target market? Is that market high in demand and low in supply? So in many ways, this is the first and most essential step to scaling any e-commerce brand or any brand for that matter. Without a product market fit, unfortunately, very unfortunately, any brand is doomed to fail. And being an agency, we've encountered hundreds of brands over the years. And this is the number one metric of brand success. When a brand comes up with a product at the right time in the right place for the right people, uh, it's has an amazing ability to make it easy to market for that brand and make it easy for that brand to grow. And on the opposite, if a brand does not have the right product for the right audience at the right time, it becomes a very expensive and very difficult project to get the brand to grow. So when product market fit fails, no amount of marketing can save the product, right? People just don't want it, no matter how much you're advertising, how much you're pushing uh, you know, paid ads, organic SEO, people aren't searching for it. They're not interested in it. They don't want it. There's better things on the market that fit their needs better. And so it becomes a, a, a veritable impossible situation to market that product. On the other hand, when you work with brands and when you see brands, and we all know these brands that have exceptional product market fit, it's almost as if the marketing does the work for itself. You launch a campaign, it's highly successful. You launch emails, everybody's opening them. You write articles, people are reading them. And that's the beauty of product market fit is that if it's a perfect fit, satisfied customers will tell everyone about it. Product market fit equals free marketing. So this is one of the biggest things that, you know, people watching this may say, oh, this is, you know, simple. Everybody knows this, but you'd be surprised how many very, very intelligent brand owners who've raised capital, uh, who've you know gone to extraordinary lengths to, to do market reports and research, still miss the product market fit. So it's something really, really to take note of and really to focus on before taking next steps. Because if you don't have the first step right, no other step will go well. So before investing in scaling your brand, if you're, you know, an early, mid, or even uh, you know, once you kind of pass the mid-sized brand, product market fit is established, but ensure you have a product that a target audience will see as a perfect fit to meet their, meet their needs. So the recommendations, how do we do this, right? We all understand, okay, yes, I need a product market fit. I wanna launch a highly successful brand. Now, how do I actually do that? Well, number one is conducting market research. If we haven't fully understand, understood the needs of our customers, if we haven't completed competitive analysis to, excuse me, to familiarize ourselves with the trends and, uh, of the market and consumers, it becomes much more complicated 
to understand what consumers want and whether or not there will be product market fit. So my first recommendation is understanding your market. My second is familiarizing yourself with competitors, right? There's a lot of competitors in any, almost any industry and just better understanding what they're doing can really clue people in to which brands are fast growing, which brands are launching successful products and which brands aren't. And by doing an unbiased competitor analysis that can give you the context you need to understand if your product will mimic some of the faster growing products or not. Second thing I would recommend <clears throat> is building a minimum viable product. An MVP is an inexpensive test that anyone can do to better understand whether or not this actually achieves product market fit. So for example, if you would like to launch uh, you know, a new shoe company or a new blue jeans company, um, just creating mock-ups of the product distributing those mock-ups to people, um, maybe making a sample set of the product and, and giving it to your friends and family, putting it online as a landing page, sending traffic to the page and asking for signups. Hey, you know, join the wait list to get this amazing new product. That's a great way without spending $100,000 on inventory. It's a great way to just start testing whether or not there's indeed demand for this product. And you know, you may say, okay, well, that's great if I'm a new brand who has zero in revenue and I just want to test something. But that's actually not true. I've worked with uh, brands that do quite a lot of revenue and that still use these techniques to test new products. For example, what they will do is create a product, create you know a full uh, live sample of the product, take product shots, load it on their website, and create a wait list for this new product saying, hey, everyone, this new product is going to launch soon. Please sign up if you're interested. And if so, we'll notify you when it launches. Now, if they get the traction they're looking for, obviously they're gonna move forward to launch and they already have a list developed of a few thousand email addresses that they can reach out to who've already expressed interest in this product. Now on the opposite side, if they really see demand is lagging for this item, they can just notify customers, hey, due to you know, inventory issues or supply, low supply and low demand, we've decided not to launch this product. Thank you so much for your interest. We'll let you know, you know if we decide again to launch it in the future. So the MVP is very important for both established brands and new brands, and it can save a tremendous amount of time, energy, and money for customers. Final um, item is just collecting user data. So actually asking your customers uh, what they think about your products for honest, unbiased reviews, obviously friends and family can be uh, sometimes not the best uh, unbiased source of information. So really getting honest feedback, soliciting honest feedback from customers tends to give us great information about how we can make our products better, whether or not people love the product once they receive it. It's not enough to just buy it. They actually have to use it for a few months and then fill out a survey and give you really unbiased information as to um, whether or not this fits their needs. Awesome. So let's talk about some benchmarks. If I have product market fit, what am I going to be seeing? Well, in the industry, we uh, expect a 30% returning customer rate for successful brands. So if you're selling something and people like it so much that they're going to come and buy another, then that would be a returning customer rate. And so what we'd like to see is at least 30% of your customers are coming back for more. And when we see that, we tend to see really successful long-term brands. When we see really low returning customer rates, it can either be that the product is extraordinarily durable and you only need one, you know, for example, a, a hammer, you know, you, you only buy a hammer once every 10 years. Um, or it can be that people actually just really don't like the product. They buy a pair of jeans, the jeans don't fit well, they're never going to return because they're no longer convinced that your brand produces jeans that are great. Number two is organic revenue. Like we said in the beginning, when you have a great product, even if it is a great hammer, People will hear about it. They will start talking about it because if it's actually considerably better than the options out there, it's cheaper, more durable, you know, less expensive, uh, higher quality, more ergonomic, whatever the metrics for each uh, product are. Organic will uh, display itself as being one of the highest growing channels. So keeping your eye on how much you're sending on through paid and how much is being generated through organic is a great understanding of how much you have to actually pay to acquire a customer, which is expensive and how much customers are actually coming to you, which is cheap and creates long-term sustainable businesses. Finally, net promoter score, which is offering a survey post-purchase is a great way to measure the success of this. 
quick example from ad space. We worked with Ana Luisa, uh, a very successful jewelry brand based in New York. Uh, we were one of the first agencies to work with them. We helped them define their product categories, test different MVPs and test different jewelry lines. And eventually we were able to get some of their best selling products um, that they currently run on their website. They experienced some pretty impressive growth through this process. So, um, you know, a lot of people think product market fit is either, you know, boring or unnecessary because they already have it, but really most people don't have it as well as they think they do. And focusing on this is very important. All right, moving forward. So now let's say you, you come to me and you say, Dan, I have a perfect product market fit. Everybody loves my product. What do I do next? The next thing you need to do to scale any e-commerce brand, once again, whether this is doing zero in revenue or doing 200 million in revenue, is you need to have an impeccable website experience that operates at a high conversion rate. So you found your product market fit. The next website is building and optimizing your website to create a high conversion experience. Site, exper site experience is key to conversion rate and conversion rate is key to high performing ad campaigns. So if you say to me, Dan, I wanna launch an amazingly high performing ad campaign, what do I do? The first thing I would tell you is get a great product and second, get a great website. Poor site experience, on the other hand, adds friction to ad campaigns, which in turn increasing advertising, increases advertising costs and reduces efficiency. So it essentially means you have to pay more for every customer that you acquire. And long term, that means that your brand will be less profitable and less profitable brands over the long term tend to go out of business. So in order to scale your brand, you must ensure that your website is fully optimized. For just simplicity and clarity, site experience essentially equals conversion rate and conversion rate equals campaign performance. So this is one of the core metrics that you need to focus on. So what are the recommendations here? Well, the first and easiest thing is make it simple for your customers to find your best products fast and easy. So a lot of websites that we work with, even brands that are established e-commerce brands, it becomes very difficult because they, they're established brands, they're doing you know, tens or even hundreds of million dollars in revenue, and they have hundreds, if not thousands of SKUs. And so all of a sudden it becomes extraordinarily difficult for customers to find the products they want on their website because there's such an overwhelming amount of products on these websites. On the flip side, smaller brands sometimes just haven't invested the amount needed to create a high converting website. So we've seen this both on small brands and large brands that site structure is key to conversion rate. So the general idea is that you wanna make it as quick, easy and frictionless as possible for clients to find your highest converting best selling products. So we always recommend clear navigation with buttons like best sellers or clear kind of like top level navigation that redirects customers exactly to the products they wanna find. Number two, we recommend um, putting the best seller section on the home page so that when you're just arriving to the home page or, or any other page for that matter, there's clear navigation to those sections. Putting recommended products at the bottom of every product page. Those are some of the simple kind of site structure recommendations we see works best. Another very simple thing to do is just to do an in-depth competitor analysis of other competitors in your field and look exactly at what they are doing. So if I'm looking at clothing, I can go pick the top three clothing brands that are doing over you know, 100, 200 million dollars in revenue and really identify some of the common best practices that all three or all five of these sites are doing. And that sometimes can really help understand just from an objective perspective, these five sites all have this in common. So clearly these elements must be somehow helping conversion uh, for these sites. Finally, um, conversion rate is all about testing. So um, running weekly, monthly sprints with software tools that enable you to test different variables on your website. Um, these software tools can uh, kind of push 50% of your traffic towards one version and push 50% to another version. They can also push 33, 33, 33. So they can divide your traffic up and A, B, and C test different versions of the website. And 
exactly track which version of the website has the highest conversion rate. And these are exceptionally powerful software tools that we recommend to help conduct sprints and test for CRO. Um, in terms of the benchmark, so obviously conversion rates vary greatly across industry, across products, um, but overall, Big Commerce, which is one of the largest e-commerce platforms in the world, I believe their second largest or third, um, has done a meta study in which they state that among all products and industries, one to three conversion is one to three percent conversion is kind of industry standard. And most stores should aim for a two percent or above. We really like to try to aim for a 2.5. This is not always possible depending on the price of the product. Sometimes higher price products tend to be uh, have lower conversion rates. Uh, but aiming for that 2% plus conversion rate is really the ideal metric to, to look for. Bounce rate. Bounce rate measures how uh, many users immediately leave the web page after arriving. We want to minimize that to 40% or less. So bounce rate can vary according to HubSpot between 26 to 70% across industries and products. The optimal range is being anywhere from 26 to 40%. If you have bounce above 40%, something is going wrong. People are more than 40% of your traffic is coming to the page, looking at the products, looking at your brand and saying very quickly, this is not what I want and leaving. And that's what we need to pre prevent is the bounce rate. So we like to say 40% is our top level bounce. We'd like to see something anywhere lower than that. 30, 20 is perfect, uh, but not above 40. Finally, average session duration in minutes. According to Clipfolio, a good average session duration, which means the amount of time the average user spends on your site, should be anywhere from two to four minutes. We, we like to think a sweet spot of around the three minute to 3.5 minute mark is good. It gives people enough time to look at everything, absorb everything, make a purchase decision, not take 20 minutes to, to get to the purchase decision and also not bounce immediately from the page. And a great case study from a brand that we've worked with is Nodpod. Nodpod is a uh, sleep mask uh, that's sold across major department stores in the United States. Uh, we implemented an extensive site redesign and CRO testing project for Nodpod that resulted in a significant increase in their conversion rate and an impressive improvement in their advertising campaign performance. So once again, when we're seeing an impressive improvement in conversion, that means that our ad campaigns in which we have to, to spend the exact same money per click, whether or not the site is converting well, when we're sending it to a high converting site, we're getting much more conversion per click. And that's resulting in a higher ROAS for our ad campaigns, which means we're able to scale faster and more profitably. Awesome. So you now have a killer product and you have a killer website. What do you do next? Customer acquisition. You need to figure out which channels make the most sense for your brand to acquire and scale customer acquisition. Customer acquisition refers to any channel a business uses to acquire customers. So if you are sending out handwritten postal mail to your customers to acquire them, that's a channel of acquisition. If you are using paid advertising on Facebook, Google, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, uh, you know, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Twitter, that's a great channel of acquisition. SEO, organic acquisition, you know, organic traffic acquisition through Google, referral, people referring other clients to you, affiliate, influencer, newspaper, TV, radio, you know, the list goes on. But those are some of the most important and most common acquisition channels that we typically see in e-commerce. A strong customer acquisition strategy typically involves a mix of at least three or more marketing channels. And these marketing channels kind of align in top funnel, middle funnel, and bottom funnel to attract, engage, and convert customers down the funnel. There's unlimited acquisition channels, but most successful brands focus around you know, three or so that really help them dial in. It's very hard to do 100 acquisition channels well, even for brands that are very large. And what we see in our experience is that the brands that do extraordinarily well have usually around three acquisition channels that they're really, really, really good at. They're not gonna be good at everything, but within the acquisition area, they typically have picked a few and have really focused on growing those. Finally, according to the advertising rule of seven, a typical customer needs to see a message from a brand at least seven times before making a purchase. And so that's where kind of the different acquisition channels come into play. 
they see you on Facebook, then they see you on Twitter, then they see you on LinkedIn, they're much more likely to make a purchase because now they've triangulated your brand through multiple platforms and are primed to purchase. In terms of best practices on acquisition, so number one, you have to test channels, right? There can be two brands, blue jean brands, and one brand is just a completely organic social driven blue jean brands. They've achieved success just through organic social. And another one that sells almost the exact same product has done all of their advertising through paid ad channels. And both of them can be in equal size. There's not one option that's better and one option that's worse. It really just depends on the brand, their strategy, what they're good at, what the founders know, who likes the product. And so what we've seen is there's been very clear examples of brands that sell almost identical products that have very, very different channels of acquisition. And um, so this is all to say that there's no right and wrong answers here. There is only data. And in order to generate that data, every brand, no matter how big or small, needs to test multiple acquisition channels to see which ones make the most sense for them. A very important point here is the difference between paid and organic. So obviously paid channels like Facebook ads can result in immediate high scaling campaigns. So out the gate, Facebook ads can generate a tremendous amount of revenue and so can Google, Snapchat, TikTok, et cetera. But on the other hand, they tend to be very expensive over time and you always have to pay for them. Organic on the other hand, takes months to implement, right? Like organic social media, organic SEO to get to the highest ranks on Google. This can take years, but definitely months at least to generate. But overall, when those organic channels are actually up and running, they can be much more profitable. So taking that into account, it's good to have both organic and paid acquisition channels in kind of a balance and not over-focus on one side because they can really uh, have a great synergy when they work together. Finally, it's very important to track attribution and customer journey. We live in an omni-channel world where almost every brand is advertising across multiple channels. And therefore, it's imperative to have software that tracks attribution and customer journey across multiple platforms so that anyone can understand where their actual revenue is being generated from. So some simple benchmarks that we like to recommend. Cost of acquisition varies tremendously between brands, but we like to see something around a $45 to $50 cost per acquisition or lower. That gives us enough budget typically to invest in the ad spend we need to generate customers. We like to see ad spend around the 287 to 300 mark. So for every dollar we spend on advertising, we like to get at least 2.8 to 3 back. And we like to see an order value a little bit over $100. Once again, this provides kind of the buffer and the margin we need in order to advertise effectively or invest in organic channels effectively. A great example um, from our own experience is the client BKR, a New York-based um, bottle company that makes sustainable glass bottles. They've been very successful, very popular. Uh, we developed an entire acquisition strategy for BKR that involved paid search, paid social, and influencer marketing that substantially increased the brand's overall revenue and profitability over a two-year period. Okay, we now have a great product, a killer website, amazing acquisition that's super dialed in and we're getting customers. Now what do we do? we need to build the lifetime value of the customers. If the customers only buy from us once and then disappear, we spend all that time and energy marketing to them just to get one purchase and then they never purchase from us again. And research shows that brands that are the most successful tend to have customers that come back and buy again and again because it's far cheaper and more profitable to retain and upsell existing customers than to acquire a new customer. Acquiring a new customer is expensive and complicated. So retaining customers requires a mix of research, segmentation, product development, and effective email and SMS communication. And what we really recommend is building out automated flows through email and SMS to drive lifetime value. So some recommendations here are um, ask for customer feedback on product development. So as you launch products and as you develop new products, your customers who have already purchased from you would love to tell you what they think about their last purchase and what they loved and didn't love. And maybe they want it in a different color and a different size and a different shape. And by asking your customers, hey, what would you like for our new product drop? You will get incredible feedback that will be very valuable. And then the customers who gave you that feedback will be much more likely to purchase. So to drive lifetime value, retention, 
and repeat purchase, we recommend asking customer feedback for product development. We also recommend implementing effective email and SMS flows. We have a blueprint at our agency that typically generates an additional 30% of total revenue by implementing these email and SMS flows. This includes seven flows with over 35 emails and about a dozen SMS messages that are automatically sending to your customer when they add to cart, abandon cart, predictive purchasing, sunset, re-engagement. All of these are specific flows that I can give more details about you know, in, in the Q&A section uh, of how they work. Lastly, always be innovating. We've seen very clearly that brands that launch new products often tend to solicit the interest of their previous customers. If you have bought something from a brand and then they tell you, hey, we're launching an absolutely new product, check it out, you're much more likely to go look at it, purchase it, see if it's better than the last product than a brand that just never launches any products. So innovate or die. In terms of the engagement rates, we like to see an average email open rate of around 50%, an average click-through rate of these automated emails of about 5.85, and we like to see around 30% of total revenue being driven by email automation and SMS automation to existing customers. So this is a significant, this is one third of your total revenue is driven through understanding how to harness your existing customers to have them repurchase from you. So it's a tremendous you know, asset in any digital marketing toolbox. And we highly recommend brands focus on it because we have run audits for brands that are doing exceptional, uh, you know, exceptionally high revenue, over 100 million in revenue, that don't actually have this aspect of their brand as dialed in as they should, and they were losing a tremendous amount of potential revenue every year by not fully understanding the power of LTV lifecycle and retention. Koala is a great example of a brand um, that has done an amazing job at implementing better LTV. We worked with Koala to implement new retention and lifecycle campaigns across both email and SMS, which resulted in a significant uptick in the amount of money they were generating, the amount of revenue they were generating from their existing customer base. Okay, we're nearing the end. So you now have a great product, a stellar website that converts exceptionally well. You know exactly which acquisition channels you work for your brand and are scaling. You're doing a great job at retargeting, remarketing, and upselling your existing customers. What is the last thing you need to do to scale? You need a great analytics and reporting software suite that tells you exactly how you're performing on the four other metrics. If you don't have this, it's very similar to driving a ship without navigation, without a map. Um, it's impossible to navigate to the right destination if you're not clearly tracking these other four areas of your brand with software and reporting tools. So we highly recommend an omni-channel dashboard and automated reporting tool. Um, we recommend benchmarking performance, so having weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, quarterly, annual reports. And that way you're able to always compare your results from last week to this week, from last month to this month, and really making sure that you're dialing in uh, exactly the trends of your performance. Automated reporting is very easy. There's a whole suite, you know, a whole series of tools that we recommend that allow you to automate reports. So these reports are created, sent to your email every morning. They can be sent to your, to your Slack channel every morning, uh, every week, bi-weekly, et cetera. And this creates a really easy way to just have automated benchmarking that's being done for you. You don't have to go in there and do anything. You set it and forget it. We recommend really focusing on attribution and customer journey. Uh, there's a whole series of new software tools coming on the market now that measure attribution and track customer journey. Uh, this helps you better understand which channels are the top funnel, which are the, you know, sometimes customers will see you on Facebook, but they won't click. Then they'll Google you, but they won't click your Google ads. And then they'll sign up for your emails and get retargeted on an email and, and convert. And without understanding that they had already seen you in those other two locations, you would think that they just, you know, were direct traffic, organic traffic that came to your email list organically. But having these attribution tools can show you where the customer has seen you before in the funnel. And that allows you to understand that these ad platforms are actually driving those conversions that you're seeing. Finally, we recommend setting KPIs in any company and tracking to KPIs, uh, which really allows any company to um, 
drive better long-term results by tracking to clear milestones. So one really important thing that we'd like to point out is that we're actually launching Growify, which is exactly the tool that we described for tracking attribution and customer journey. This is a new tool that I've developed over the past two years. We've tested it with over a hundred clients. Um, people absolutely love it. It's a, it's a customer attribution and customer journey tool that allows you to model cause and effect, measure and track your KPIs to understand how they affect your store, track your profitability, track your customer journey, understand exactly which channels are producing the best results and how they mix together in an omni-channel strategy. And it also helps you automate reports. So definitely something that I recommend checking out uh, if it's something you need help with. Finally, in conclusion, the five pillars provides a simple framework that any brand can use to achieve success. At AdSpace, which is the agency I founded, we specialize in helping e-commerce brands implement these five pillars correctly into their businesses to help them grow their brand rapidly and efficiently. We've helped do this for over 100 customers. We've worked all the way from pre-revenue, zero, you know, zero uh, revenue startups to 200 plus brands that are very mature, successful e-commerce brands. We've seen success with every type of brand that we've worked with using this framework. So it's a framework that we highly recommend and stand firmly behind. Um, as Tom Fishburne once said, the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing. If anyone wants to talk to me more about you know, their uh, struggles, goals, help needed with marketing campaigns, would love to stay in touch. Once again, <clears throat> my agency name is AdSpace. That's adspaceagency.com. You can reach me anytime at dan at adspaceagency.com. And our website is www.adspaceagency.com. Thank you so much. Uh, I will pause here and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really insightful uh, and very interesting to see the case studies, the amount of metrics that you're able to gain. It was really, really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, that we'd love to ask you. Um, to start off, I think there's a lot of interest in uh, hearing a little bit about you and how you got involved in digital marketing and e-commerce. What was the inception of your um, you know, personal journey? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so I've been involved in e-commerce for over 10 years, something around the 15-year mark now. It's been a long time. Um, I initially became very interested in digital marketing when I was uh, in college. Um, I then started my first agency that was helping con consumer SaaS startups, uh, actually based in Tel Aviv. So we were an agency based in Tel Aviv that was working with companies there. Um, we scaled really rapidly and had some great success for our clients and eventually sold that agency uh, to another agency that acquired our, our portfolio of clients. I then started an e-commerce brand in 2012 called Incas. Incas was in the early kind of crop of e-commerce brands. We used Facebook ads very effectively from 2012 to around 2016 to scale super rapidly. We were actually featured on Facebook's website as one of their case studies on how to use the platform effectively. Eventually we sold that brand in 2016. I then completed my MBA at the University of Texas and started consulting with other fast growing D2C brands. And that's how I launched AdSpace, which is now uh, my new agency that works with a lot of D2C brands. I thought I recognized the name. I'm from the Tel Aviv area myself, so that's a uh, very nice. Little, I, can, uh, I, can, I can tell by the accent. <laughs> very slight, it's a, you know, very slight accent, but yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So names, accent, it all gives it away. Um, cool, very nice. Um, there is an additional question about the differences in selection of appropriate advertising channels for B2B and B2C. So obviously there's a lot of differences between the different approaches. Can you say a couple words on that and what you recommend? Absolutely, yeah. So we deal with both lead gen and, um, and D2C clients. Um, here's my overall recommendation. There's very, very different strategies for B2B and D2C. Um, we really recommend using lead magnets and informational marketing campaigns on the consumer channels. What does that mean in plain English? It means that when you're using channels like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, these channels target millions of customers, literally. And so it becomes very difficult because you're catching a lot of people in those campaigns that are not your B2B customer, right? 
they're looking for other products, they're looking for D2C items. And so it becomes very important to filter that traffic by using lead magnets such as white papers. So for example, if I'm a B2B company and I'm looking for um, you know, marketing agencies, we'll call it. In order to only attract the right marketing agencies, I can create a white paper that specifically says the top 10 best things that every digital marketing agency needs to know in order to scale. Automatically, I'm gonna disqualify 99% of people who are not digital marketing agency owners by creating that and advertising that white paper. So by using informational assets in the marketing campaigns, you can disqualify irrelevant leads. And what happens is that substantially reduces your cost per click, reduces bad leads, and essentially makes your advertising campaigns much more efficient. So we've, we've had a lot of experience with really interesting campaigns that use white papers. And the white papers both attract the right people, repel the wrong people, and also kind of educate the person who downloads the white paper about how your business can help them achieve their goal. So that's kind of a, a quick, you know, um, just tip and strategy that we found works really well for those B2B campaigns. That makes a lot of sense and a great way to kind of tighten your, your funnel or your pipeline. Um, the next question is about uh, attribution. So what are the best channels to track attribution in your mind? Yeah. So. Attribution is kind of the new frontier of digital marketing. Everybody understands that without, under, you know, without fully understanding the customer journey, without fully understanding the attribution, Facebook is always going to say they're going to and, you know, kind of exaggerate how many conversions they claim. Google is going to exaggerate their conversions. And what you're going to have is an overlapping group where two, Facebook and Google both claim the same conversion, right? And so we recommend tracking every attribution channel the old way to track attribution channels was through UTM parameters, which are still very relevant. The new way to track attribution is by using third-party pixels, right? So a, a pixel that is not part of Facebook pixels, it's not part of Google's pixel, it's your own brand pixel. And because it's your own pixel, you can actually set the parameters that you want the pixel to operate on. And so it can track Facebook, it can track Google, it can track Pinterest, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, affiliate, influencer, direct, et cetera. And that's kind of the core of what we built at Growify. Mm -hmm. By using a tool like Growify, we give you a pixel that you can implement on your website and you can now track every single ad channel that you use and every single organic channel. And all of a sudden you now have kind of 360 degree transparency on your customer journey and attribution and you don't have to rely on what Facebook is saying, what Google is saying, and then what Google Analytics is saying and try to like triangulate all of these uh, sources of information to try to find your one source of truth. So we recommend tracking every channel and we recommend using software that is not part of the kind of, you know, ad channels themselves to track the ad channels. And that way you can compare what the ad channels are reporting and what your own software is reporting. Understood. And this actually leads us really nicely into the next question, which is whether Growify is only used for e-commerce or does it have additional use cases? Yeah, it's a great question. So we use Growify for both e-com and B2B. So it's it's a very simple attribution tool. It can be used for any product, any company, any website. We work with you know, WordPress brands, brands that are built on WordPress, big commerce, um, you know, Shopify, obviously. Uh, but any other platform like Squarespace or anything else can use the same pixel, the same platform and track their attribution. Excellent. And we're actually nearing the end of our time. So one final question kind of to leave the audience uh, with, if you had to kind of leave us with one key takeaway from your presentation today, what would that be? Absolutely. Product market fit is the most important. It's, that's the most important because we see brands all the time that come to us and they have a business and they're like, look, we're doing a few million, it's going well, but we can't, you know, and we can't scale. We don't know why. And what sometimes, you know, it's a question of marketing, but sometimes it's a question of the actual product just only being very niche, right? And so designing the right product that has, you know, the ability to scale is very important. And we do always try to kind of bring down to the level of what is the product how many people want this product? What's the overall market value and potential of this product? Because that's going to define how effective the marketing campaigns are. Um, you know, no matter how much you try to convince people, corduroy pants are not going to surpass blue jeans, right? Like people just don't, it's just, it's a market fact. As much as I may love corduroy and maybe I created a brand of corduroy pants, 
people just like blue jeans and that's what they want. And so if I want to market my corduroy brand, I may be able to get traction and success, but it's never going to be as successful as a blue jean brand because the blue jean market is so much larger than the corduroy market. And so understanding how those market dynamics impact your product development is key to kind of creating products that a lot of people want. And that's key to creating great marketing campaigns. So focus on product market fit first, the rest will come easily. A hundred percent. What a great way to wrap up the session. Thank you so much, Dan, for being here and sharing all of these uh, great insights with us. Thank you to the audience uh, who's joined us today. This was the last session on the tools and channels track, and we're looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Thank you Thanks so much. It was great to talk to you, Sahar. Great speaking with you as well. Bye-bye. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, but I'm just a human.